America. Things have changed just a little bit, haven't they? Let's see, are you a boy or a girl? There are boys and there are girls. Sometimes even God makes mistakes. According to some, there are sexually dimorphic characteristics of men. Maybe someone can brains. just be born in the wrong body? Let me make you a bet. If you have, in your own head, accepted trans people and think of yourself as maybe an ally, I bet that you still don't actually understand what it means to be trans. I also bet that if you've heard a narrative regarding trans people in society, it probably goes something like this. Ever since they were a child, they were adamant to anyone who would listen that they were born in the wrong body. I'm going to focus on the trans woman narrative, since that's the one I am personally familiar with, but understand that all of what I'm about to say can also apply to trans men, as well as NBs, gender fluid people, and anyone else who otherwise doesn't neatly fit into the gender binary. So let's go back to that trapped in the wrong body narrative, specifically that of a girl trapped in a boy's body. You have probably heard a story like this about someone who, from a very young age, tried on their sister's or their mother's dresses in secret, or enjoyed playing with the quote-unquote wrong toys like dolls or other such stereotypically gendered activities. This young girl probably grew up at least briefly to identify as a gay man, because, well, women are or should be attracted to men and vice versa. Then, at some point, they finally come out as a trans woman. They probably started hormone therapy eventually, and slowly began to take on more physically feminine traits until, if they're so lucky, finally passing as a cis woman to most or even all people. This is a story I almost guarantee you have heard in some form or another. I certainly had, though you may not have ever given it much thought beyond that. Maybe you say to yourself, consciously or otherwise, I accept that. Some people are just born in the wrong body, and I support their decision to be who they feel most comfortable as. And again, maybe you consider yourself an ally to queer people, and maybe you even have some trans friends that you definitely don't tokenize. All of this is relatively common in the modern age. Well, let me first say that some stereotypes are at least partially based in reality, and that these kinds of trans people most definitely do exist. They may even be the most common kinds of stories, hence why you have heard such a narrative before. But I also want to tell you that this is not the only valid trans narrative, not by any means. In fact, this video is meant to explain, from my own perspective, how there is no single universal trans experience. The only person who can determine if someone is trans is the person whose gender identity is in question to begin with. My friend Aaron had this to say, quote, I grew up being a very open ally because I didn't really understand how it should matter to others on what makes a person themselves, as long as they're happy and safe. I grew up with the narrative and assumption that the trans experience was very much the trapped in the wrong body feeling, but I enjoyed certain aspects of my childhood that were stereotypically opposite to who I knew I was inside. I, a trans man, didn't really mind the dresses or makeup because, for me, accessories weren't part of someone's gender identity, but a tool that they can use to express it, or just themselves. So when I came out, it was a confusing experience for my loved ones and me because clothes and makeup wasn't what made me who I was. Shout out to the person on YouTube from eight years ago who made me realize I didn't have to be in a bubble of masculine or feminine, I could just be me. I actually 
cried when they told me it was a boy. You've always been kind of weird, haven't you? Oh, you mean the kid with all the mental health issues? I mean, he cries more than most girls. Now, I'm going to talk about my own experience here, but I really, really need to emphasize that this is just my experience. If you relate to some of it, or none of it at all, great. You don't have to in order to be transgender. Something I want to be very clear about is that gender, and even biological sex, are to a certain extent a performance. And yes, social constructs. Oh yes, indeed I went there. You heard me right. We'll get back to that, but guess what? Intersex people exist, and it doesn't take a lot of digging for the very concept of the sex binary to break down once you know that. It's a way to categorize things because we like things to be easily digestible and instantly understandable. But the reality is that things are complicated. Sex is complicated. Love is complicated. Life is complicated. And no matter how hard you desperately try to put everyone and everything into a neat little category, some things will always defy those categories. And if you're actually being honest with yourself, you'll realize that any such exceptions in effect demonstrate that the rules are entirely arbitrary. So what I'm about to describe about my own experience is not an example of a correct way to be trans. There is no such thing. The only possible way I could think of that I might consider incorrect would be a bigoted cis person pretending to feel trans when they don't in order to try and have a gotcha. But in my experience, those people are so very easy to identify as grifters or liars that they aren't worth actually considering. Not to mention that I probably think that even people like that are actually just closeted or ashamed of their own queerness and use it as a means of making money or earning clout. But there is not a single correct trans narrative. All of that being said, here is my story. For most of my life, I identified as male. Granted, I never put much thought into it, and whenever I did, I would always hesitate a little bit. But my understanding of transgender people was, as I said, very narrow, and rooted in that mainstream narrative of the person who always knew, the person who was born in the wrong body. When I look back now, there were certainly always signs, but that isn't universal either, and what those signs were is also going to vary a great deal from person to person. I distinctly remember certain conversations I had, usually with partners, the gender conversation as it were. It would usually involve me saying something to the effect of, oh, I don't know, I've often thought maybe I wasn't totally this or totally that, but I don't know. And then I would bury that thought and literally just not think about it because to me, that wasn't being trans, that was just maybe being a little bit curious. But the two weren't related, they couldn't possibly be, right? There's this song that I wrote when I was 15 or 16 and, well, let me play the line for you. The actual recording of my voice is from when I was about 21 or so, but the lyrics never changed. Father, I'm doing all I can, but I don't want to be a man. I would rather be alive. Or I think about how throughout my life, in every romantic relationship I ever had, I was always considerably envious of the way that the woman in the dynamic was stereotypically expected to be treated. How, even if my girlfriend at the time didn't necessarily want those things, I always did. I wanted to be the one to get asked out. I wanted to get flowers or be told that I was beautiful. I wanted to be treated delicately or to be courted, as it were. I wanted the role of the woman in a relationship, but also being attracted to other women really confused those thoughts and made things even messier since obviously only straight cis relationships are truly valid. 
I would find myself desperately trying to fit my own disconnected experiences into the template of the male category, and increasingly as I went through puberty, I found myself dissociating as the only means of remaining sane. I didn't exactly realize that's what I was doing at the time, but looking back, it definitely was. My experience as a woman primarily attracted to other women, but not knowing on a conscious level that I was allowed to identify that way, created a dissonance in my head. But all the while this was going on, I still didn't, on a conscious level, believe or even think that I was secretly a woman or that I wanted to be one. I didn't even actively oppose thinking of myself as a man. It felt very distinctly wrong to identify that way, and the sight of my own body made me very uncomfortable in a way that I couldn't understand or identify, but I was a man. Obviously, that's, that's what I was told, and I was nothing if not heavily reliant on authority figures to tell me what was and was not acceptable. But I was a very feminine boy. I was never an overtly masculine one. I wasn't super short, but I was smaller, narrower, always had a very soft face even well into high school, and didn't even start to grow beard hair until I was probably 25. I was the kind of kid who was constantly called a fat or a queer, before we'd reclaimed the word, by the more overtly masculine boys. I was the boy who had mostly a group of other female friends because, for whatever reason, despite being able to have friendships with boys, it was just never quite the same and never quite what I was looking for. But I could never put my finger on why I felt that way. I didn't know why it was much easier to be friends with girls and that I preferred it. That's just how it was. And being a trans girl who doesn't yet know she's a trans girl and desperately wanting to have meaningful relationships with other women beyond high school that weren't sexual became increasingly impossible because of my own perceptions of my sexuality and other people's outward perceptions that I was, in fact, just a man. One of the biggest signs to me looking back on my life was my intense envy from the earliest days in school of the relationships that other girls had with each other. I was able to have some of that eventually in grade school towards the end, but once everyone started going through puberty, everything changed, and all of a sudden, I had to start hanging out with the boys. It's not like I didn't want to, but I also didn't want to in the same way that I wanted to hang out with my platonic female friends. I want to be clear here once again, if you are a cis man and you're comfortable in identifying that way, there is nothing that says you can't want or like feminine things and still be a cis man. There is no correct way to perform gender. There is no correct way to be trans. Think about if you've ever known someone who identified as female who was a tomboy and how you consider them just as much a woman as a more stereotypically feminine cis woman. All of these things are separate. Gender expression, gender roles, gender identity, and assigned biological sex. They are completely separate. There is a double standard that is largely a result of the constraining nature of the masculine gender role that is mostly accepting of women taking on stereotypically male traits. But when it comes to men taking on stereotypically female traits, they are usually immediately in danger of being labeled as a freak, a deviant, or even a pedophile. A cis woman in her mid-twenties wants to wear boy pants, t-shirts, and no makeup? Cool, no problem whatsoever. A cis man in his mid-twenties wants to wear a dress out in public? Well, that's just weird. He must be some kind of freak, like one of those drag queens or transgenders. This is just one manifestation of toxic masculinity. Now, hold on, hold on. Don't click off just yet. If you're a straight, cisgendered man watching this, understand this. I am not blaming you specifically for the existence of toxic men. You might not be one. 
I am blaming the way in which we socialize young men in general in societies around the globe. There is nothing inherent about being a man that makes them toxic, I don't think. There is instead a dangerous permission that cultures around the world give to young men, though, through the process of their education. Permission to abuse their privileged position in society with little to no consequences. The only thing that you need in order to be a gender which is different from the one you were assigned at birth is to want to be another gender. If you want to be a girl, consider that maybe you already are. If you want to be a boy, same thing. One of the most mind-blowing and powerful facts that I've learned in my journey of self-discovery has been that cis people actually enjoy being the gender they were assigned at birth. Cis men like being cis men. Cis women like being cis women. I don't mean any of the things that we necessarily assign to those gender roles as a society, but just in general. Cis people can also experience gender euphoria and dysphoria. If you are a cis straight man and putting on a dress and feminizing makeup does make you uncomfortable, you don't necessarily hate women. It might be that you're experiencing that your gender isn't correctly matching your sex assigned at birth. And that is gender dysphoria. Or you can just enjoy it on a completely aesthetic level with or without experiencing dysphoria. There is no correct way to do any of this. It is up to you, and everyone is different. A lot of these assumptions are actually a product of things like gender roles, and especially toxic masculinity and the patriarchy, but I'm trying to reach the people whose brains immediately shut down when they hear those terms. If it makes you feel any better, I was one of those people for a long time. So now I think it's about time to talk about another aspect of the trans experience that I've found to be quite common in trans women. Again, this is not universal, and I obviously don't have statistics on just how common this is, but let's talk about gender envy and misogyny. So I basically just dated by gender swap. Wait, so does not everyone feel this way? Misogyny is everywhere in our culture. In fact, it's baked into the very fabric of most modern cultures around the world. Patriarchy is very much the norm, but if you are a cis man who is perfectly comfortable with identifying as a man, then please lower your guard. Depersonalize what you just heard me say. I am not attacking you. I am attacking a concept, and it's one that you can consciously choose to reject and still call yourself a man. The fact that so many cis men either consciously or subconsciously associate things like dominance over women, being the provider, or even violence as an inherent part of what it means to be masculine is yet another example of toxic masculinity and is in and of itself misogyny. If you don't personally associate those things with masculinity, that's great. Sadly, you might be in the minority. And if you don't believe me, just look at the number of countries which still effectively treat women as second-class citizens. Look at how few female world leaders there are in comparison to male ones. Or even, since you're very likely to be American, look at the recent repeal of Roe v. Wade in the supposed best country on earth. I mean, for fuck's sakes, look at the results of the most recent election. These are all forms of misogyny. The inherent distrust, exclusion, and hatred of women which is so embedded in our world that you probably don't even notice it most of the time. And to be clear, it isn't just men who can perpetuate misogyny. Even other women do it. It's a problem that's well beyond the scope of this video, but now that I've laid out the basics, Let's get to how it presented in me, growing up, believing that I was still a cis man. If you believe yourself to be cisgender, that is, you are comfortable in identifying with the gender you were assigned at birth, I want you to ask yourself a question. This is just a YouTube video, nobody needs to be watching it with you. This can and should be done entirely in the privacy of your own head. Ask yourself this. Have you ever daydreamed about what it would be like to be a gender that's different from the one you were assigned at birth? 
Now, hear what I said specifically. Daydreamed. I don't mean, have you ever briefly thought as a man that, oh, women actually have an easier time when it comes to this specific thing, or vice versa. I mean, actually wondered, for an extended period of time, what it would be like to be another gender. In my experience, the vast, vast, vast majority of cis people will instantly and without any hesitation answer this question with a simple no. If you hesitated, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're trans, but it's something I strongly recommend that you examine in your own head on your own time. At any point in my life, after I became aware of the concepts of gender or sex, if you had asked me this question, I would have probably given a long, meandering answer. This is like those conversations that I remember having when I was a teenager with girlfriends. My answer would have always been, yeah, kinda, but I didn't associate that with being transgender, if I even knew the word at the time when I was asked. I thought everyone had those kinds of thoughts. Let me assure you, they do not. Most people who are cis are actually completely comfortable in identifying with their assigned gender at birth. That is the norm. Most men are not looking at women with a confused sense of jealousy that they think is lust. No, most of the time they're just lusting in the simplest way imaginable. Having always been jealous of the performance of femininity, but not quite realizing it was a performance, when I was a teenager, I went through a breakup. In fact, a breakup with the very person I had that first gender conversation with, but the breakup was less than mutual, let's say. I was hurt, I felt alone, and I felt abandoned. Slowly, that pain and misery was allowed to congeal into actual hatred for women. If you had asked me, I would have never said that I hated women. Even in my own head, I couldn't possibly be a misogynist. No, no, no. I was an egalitarian who just wanted equal treatment for all. But in reality, I was bitter and envious. When I look back now, a large part of why I went down this road was because subconsciously, and perhaps even a little bit consciously, I wanted to be treated like a woman because I was a woman, and that option being completely locked away from me just made me angrier and fueled my misogynistic tendencies. This is called, in both trans women and cis women, internalized misogyny. I want to be clear again, this absolutely does not mean that any outwardly presenting cis man who behaves in these ways is secretly trans. Not at all. There are plenty, and I do mean plenty, of men who are actually just hateful of women for a variety of ridiculous reasons. But it does mean that someone outwardly behaving this way could secretly be trans. But remember, there is no universal trans experience. This is simply mine. In fact, my own misogyny got so bad when I was a young adult that I got swept up in the fervor of a truly disgusting and hateful movement called Gamergate, which I hope to God you haven't heard of, but trust me, I'll be covering that eventually too. Best to cancel myself before any of y'all bitches get the chance, but if you can keep an open mind, stick around, please. I never participated in doxing campaigns or Twitter harassment or anything that egregious. I was simply a useful idiot to the movement, and that's a shame that I will have to carry for the rest of my life. Now, these days, the predominant form of feminism that at least I see in mainstream culture is what we would call intersectional feminism, or sometimes fourth wave feminism. This is a feminism that not only acknowledges, but puts front and center the many different ways that all women are discriminated against across all cultures and where those things intersect. In particular, it seeks to counteract what we have come to call white feminism or girl boss feminism, which overshadowed the struggles that women of color faced that are specific to their experience in favor of focusing on the problems of almost exclusively white women in the Western world, for lack of a better term. 
intersectional feminism is a feminism that not only includes and recognizes the importance of dealing with the specific challenges faced by women of color and trans women, but it also puts those issues at the forefront, not just the issues of women like she who shall not be named. Well, although intersectional feminism is very much not a new thing, my perception at the very least was that girl boss slash white feminism was, at the time of Gamergate, the most mainstream and in-your-face kind of feminism out there. Now, continuing to try and be as clear as possible, I am not saying that no one associated with white or girl boss feminism ever raised good or important points. I am not saying that their struggles are less or not important, but I am saying that as a whole, that brand of feminism, as it were, was very much a brand, and one that I think may have unintentionally or not did some harm to both men and women. It was this kind of feminism that pushed me further into a pit of self-loathing, hatred, and bitterness because it so often failed to even recognize the ways in which patriarchy itself also harmed men by forcing them into tight little boxes of conformity just as strict as the ones for women, but different. And remember, at the same time, I still thought I was a man, but I knew I didn't fit into the vast majority of stereotypes surrounding masculinity. I wasn't tough, I wasn't strong, I wasn't masculine in almost any of the traditional ways. I didn't like sports, I didn't like being physical, I didn't like almost anything that was typically associated with being a man. So when I heard white feminism attacking these concepts of masculinity and patriarchy, but seeming to have little or no actual sympathy for the ways in which these things also harmed men, it sunk me further in, rather than pull me out. I became... <sighs> a men's rights activist. All of my life, I had seen this trope of a man, often a more nerdy one like I thought I was, having no idea how to speak to women, being inherently scared of the very concept of it. For me, I had always found it much easier to speak to women and be friends with them. I had that group of platonic girlfriends in grade school that I continued to be friends with until high school until puberty started ruining things for me, but for some reason my tiny little mind couldn't understand why. When I started to write this script, the election was still undecided. As of now, though, it's not only evidently clear that Trump has won re-election, but that he also won the popular vote, and his new MAGA loyalist-controlled Republican Party also looks to have won the House as well. Things are not looking good, and the last week has been very scary for queer people in America, and even up here in Canada, where I am. We have an election coming up next year, and it's very likely that our own politicians will, in at least some ways, capitulate to what the U.S. does, as we always do. So we're also scared about what the implications are for trans people here with this resounding victory of hate, transphobia, and overt bigotry especially with attacks already taking place on trans youth health care in places like Alberta. These are scary times for queer folk, women, POC, immigrants. A lot of people who aren't straight, white, cishet men are apprehensive, you might say, about the future, especially in America, since they tend to often set the tone for much of the Western world, especially my country of Canada. I don't say any of this to scare you, but this is the reality that we currently find ourselves in. So what we do next, as queer people, is absolutely crucial. Now, perhaps more than any time in recent history, we have to be united, on some level, against those who wish to see us exterminated for just being different. One of the things that has forced me to not just make this video, but to release it on my old channel full of bigoted people, is the fact that I know fewer queer people in my audience would see it if I only put it on the new channel. And right now, we need as many people who are capable of doing so to step up and defend those of us in the community who can't as easily stand up for themselves. To be the new, older generation of queer adults, 
and be the examples that future generations will need to survive and to thrive. Right now, the most radical thing that you can do is stay alive, survive. Resistance is not futile. We can only work together to start doing everything that we need to get through these next four years and beyond if we're still here to do it. Resist, survive, and don't give up hope, please. If you've made it this far into the video, I hope or assume that you are either queer yourself, questioning, or you think of yourself as an ally to queer folk. I am taking what feels like the biggest risk of my life in putting myself out to an audience of people who, for the most part, have very little nice to say about me or my lifestyle anymore. But I hope that those of you who aren't like that, who have found some interest in hearing me discuss this dramatic change in my life, or who are themselves questioning their gender identity or even just interested in seeing where I plan to go with all of this, will take the time to subscribe to my new channel, Misinformed. This video is also up over there, but the nature of YouTube means it won't be monetizable for probably a while, which means that having a mirror over here on the first channel is good for bringing in new people and, you know, keeping my rent paid. As of now, I'm also planning to keep up my Patreon page to keep it all the same, but with a new name, and all of my legacy posts will become available in one giant thread for all new patrons who sign up at any tier. That includes over a hundred original music tracks just from my old work. So from now on, this is how things will look for me. I have the new main channel, where my actual interest and effort will be going misinformed. I have the old channel, The Criminal Historian, which I will be keeping in my back pocket for the release of GTA 6, and in case I need to make some small videos in order to pay bills now and then. And then finally, I have my personal secondary channel, where you can find my Let's Plays, music videos, unedited vlogs, and other similar such things. You're probably watching this on the old channel, but links to all three will be in the description. Now let's finally get back to the video. In a historic move, Roe v. Wade has been repealed, so feminists don't hate men and only interested in a feminism that includes trans women. At some point, the mainstream, at least on the internet, conversation around feminism began to shift, though. I realized that now women of color, and more specifically, trans women, were included in the conversation about patriarchy and the damage it does to all of us. I began to actually listen to feminists speak and finally agree with basically everything I heard. The narrative had shifted, and intersectionality had become the dominant accepted form of feminism. Again, at least on the internet, or more specifically the parts of the internet that I inhabited. This gradually shifted everything for me. It started with me finding myself in agreement with basically everything I heard coming from this new wave of feminists that was only now being granted a larger voice in the conversation. For a while, I would have continued to call myself an egalitarian or something similar while believing in effectively everything that intersectional feminism was saying, but still being reluctant to call myself a feminist because of the baggage I had associated with it during that girl boss era. And then, just after my YouTube channel took off and it became a source of income for me in the fall of 2021, I went through a very rough breakup. The first and only real relationship that I'd had as an adult with a girlfriend whom I'd been living with for four years. I went into a really dark place. By the summer of 2022, I finally convinced myself to try something new that I thought might be able to bring me back to life, so to speak. For literal years, probably more than a decade, I had been telling myself that I would go and play music at a place that had always topped Google searches when I would look up the most popular open mic in my city. In July of 22, I convinced my best friend to go with me, and it forever changed my life. I don't know, I've always felt like I wasn't fully male. What if you were not 
I had shown up at a perfect time, right at the beginning of a new wave, a new chapter, you might say, in the place's history. A new host had just taken over less than a month before, and every night they would play music that reminded me that there were people just as talented as the big names I'd idolized all of my life, just hidden away in places like this with less than 100 monthly listeners on their Spotify. I wouldn't learn this about them specifically until later, but they turned out to be non-binary. But it was actually the keyboard player in their band that really changed things for me. Over the course of the next year, I built up a reputation and a name for myself in this local music scene completely naturally. To the point of most people knowing who I was there and being able to run into people around town who had either heard of me or knew somebody that I knew because of this open mic. And then that keyboard player, shortly after my arrival, came out publicly as non-binary. And since I was already their friend, suddenly I had a non-binary friend. And subconsciously, I made the connection that that was something someone could be and that it was totally okay. By the spring of 23, that first new host had given over the reins to the keyboard player and went on to do other things, but I had become a good friend to both of them. Good enough to fulfill a goal that I'd had in my head since the moment I first arrived there, to eventually host the open mic night myself, which I got asked to do twice in the fall of that year. By now, the first host, whom I'll call Jack, had also come out as non-binary to the folks in the music scene, and the second one, whom I'll call Harmony, had been out and proud for a little more than a year. I had at least two NB friends, and I had, without realizing it, become gradually and gradually more accepting of those kinds of things. I had even started calling myself a feminist. I had also by now gotten a new roommate and been extremely lucky because she and I had become close friends. Her best friend would come over and the three of us would hang out and smoke and just talk and, well, then it started. So by late 23, I had a band and I was meant to play a gig at that bar in the center of this new community that I'd become a part of. I had an aesthetic vision of how I was going to look on stage, but I was missing something. I needed a pair of white jeans. So I went to a thrift shop nearby me and what do you know, they had a pair of white jeans just like I needed. Only problem was they were women's jeans. I remember for the first time there and then confronting this inner voice that said something along the lines of, well, obviously we can't wear those. Those are for women. and I'm just a man. I also remember responding in my head, wait, what? Why the hell do I care? I don't. I literally just don't actually care about wearing women's pants, but other men do, and I guess women do? I mean, that's not what men are supposed to do. Men aren't supposed to wear women's clothing. That's the most egregious sin you could commit as a straight man. But screw that. I need those pants, and... It's not like anyone would ever be able to tell besides me. I didn't even know until she told me after all. So I bought the jeans, completed the outfit, played the gig, and killed it, looking actually good for one of the first times in my life. I was starting to put care into my appearance, and I had been growing out my hair over the course of two years. And I'd finally found community. I was still feeling this intense, indescribable incongruity, but things were looking up. I decided after that gig, I was going to start ignoring that voice every time I heard it from now on. Whenever I encountered something that was not what a man was supposed to do, that I wanted to do regardless, I would ignore it and tell it to go fuck itself. That was how it started. But then one night, my egg finally cracked. I always describe it like this. Have you ever heard of the concept of a sleeper agent? As far as I know, it's a purely fictional idea, but the idea is a secret agent who doesn't know that they're a secret agent. But as soon as they hear a certain phrase or word, they are awoken to their true agenda and unlock memories they didn't know they had so that they can carry out their mission. Well, it was a lot like that. Me, my roommate, and her best friend were all hanging out and smoking. When I started talking about Harmony, and how they made me accept non-binary people were a thing, 
and how the whole gender binary was probably bullshit to begin with. It was effectively the gender conversation, which I'd had a few times over the course of my life, but never had the mental permission to have freely with myself. And all they said to me was, maybe you're non-binary. It wasn't instant. I remember going, huh, I guess, no, I couldn't be, or could I? And then probably brushed it off as we all smoked another bowl and continued about the night. But it stuck with me. I couldn't get it out of my head. I started thinking about it every day and every night. It was probably only a few days later when I finally decided to just try and see how it would feel identifying that way, and using they-them pronouns like Harmony and Jack did. It was probably only a few days or maybe a week or two after that when I decided to just try something crazy. I just decided to try and use a female voice in my head. You know, like your inner voice that you hear in your head? Well, I just tried to make it sound feminine, just to see what would happen, and well, it made me emotional in a way that I was absolutely not prepared for. I remember crying and talking to my roommate and her friend about it, and how I thought that maybe, possibly, I could be a trans woman. I didn't realize it at the time, but there was no going back. Not mentally. I had discovered something about myself. Now it was a matter of accepting myself for who I was. The egg had been cracked, as we say. I came out to my father that December only to be rejected, and then a week later, right around Christmas, came out to my mother, who I hadn't spoken to in over a year for unrelated reasons, and she said something that continues to be very validating. I'm not surprised. My sister took a little while to wrap her head around it, but these days she and I also have a much closer relationship. My mother and I are closer than we've ever been, and my father... Well, something else incredibly validating was the sheer amount of people who knew me before that saw how consistently bright and happy I am now, and who would say to me, completely independent of each other, you seem so much more like yourself. Because I finally am. I have finally started living the life I have always wanted to live. I just didn't have the language, knowledge, or mental permission to do it until I was almost 30 years old. One of the most useful analogies I've found when describing this experience has been that of the fishbowl. My whole life, I was just a goldfish swimming around in a tiny little fishbowl. I had my pebbles, I had my castle, I had my life. This was what I had. I had no reason to question it. I could see that there were things beyond my grasp, but... I could never reach them, so why bother even trying? Then, somebody scooped me up and tossed me into the ocean, and I was like, Whoa. And exploring the depths of the ocean is a long and tedious process. In fact, probably an impossible task. It's scary, but simultaneously very exciting, and I can't wait to see what else I can find down here. Here's an observation I made shortly after coming to the realization that I was trans. It obviously applies here specifically to the trans experience, but I think more broadly, it can be applied to a lot of experiences that marginalized groups have. I remember thinking, probably not in so much detail, that I did have sympathy for people who were trans. While I, like most people, was most certainly transphobic in a lot of ways that I didn't realize, if you had asked me, I probably would have said that I support trans people and that I was sympathetic. 
after all, that sounds really hard to be born in the wrong body. Again, remember, this is how I used to think. I remember thinking, to some extent, that I could imagine what something like that would be like. When I would hear the typical narratives that mainstream society likes to trot out for tokenization, I would go, Oh, wow, that must be really hard. I can put myself in someone's shoes like that and imagine to some extent what it must be like, and wow, that's really difficult. First of all, yeah, it fucking is. But second of all, no. No, I could not imagine what it was like. And more importantly, referring to cis people who have some variation of this thought, no, no you most certainly cannot. Transitioning has made me hyper aware that you might think you can imagine what an experience would be like, maybe even go into detail in your head. It would be like this and this, this kind of thing would happen, I would have to deal with this or that. But imagining or sympathizing with an experience you've never had, or more importantly, can never have, is so very different from actually experiencing it yourself. Trust me on this one. The things I have had to put up with as a trans woman in just the last year is... Well, this video is already long enough. Oh jeez, look at the runtime. We don't have time for that. And again, I've only been going through this explicitly for a single year, so I can only imagine what someone who transitioned years or decades ago could list here, but I guarantee you it would be a lot. This experience has made me hyper aware of my own xenophobic tendencies and caused me to make a very conscious effort in being humble to people who experience things that I never can, and listening to them as much as possible. I myself, as a white trans woman in one of the most accepting countries for queer identities on the planet, can't actually imagine what it must be like to, say, be black in America, or to be born a woman and raised in Palestine, etc, etc. I can't ever have those experiences, and no matter how hard I try to imagine what that must be like, the experience of sympathizing or empathizing with someone else's experience that you can never have is infinitely different than actually experiencing it yourself in ways that you couldn't possibly imagine. This is why the answer for someone like me, or you depending on your own socio-political background, is to listen to those marginalized voices and never try to speak for them. If you are able to use your own privileges to amplify their voices, great, but never, and I mean never presume, to truly understand their lived experiences enough that you feel comfortable enough to speak for them, no matter how good your intentions might be. Let me assure you, unless you are one, you have no idea what it's like to be a trans woman. You might think you know. You might even think that you know with the best of intentions, but you don't. You can't. And that's okay. This thing that we call being human is so varied, so unique, that even attempting to wrap your head around the seemingly infinite amount of ways that we can experience it is a vain and pointless exercise, in my humble opinion. So, humble yourself, and understand that we can't all know everything. Nobody can. There are things you will simply never be able to truly get, because your experience is exactly that. It's yours, and yours alone. And that's not only okay, <laughs> it's actually beautiful. If you've ever heard someone use the term special snowflake to denigrate this kind of observation of our uniqueness, or perhaps even done it yourself, I'm here to break it to you that yes, in fact, we are all completely and utterly unique. Even a human clone, which thankfully isn't a thing yet, and dear god I hope it won't ever be, still wouldn't have the exact same experiences as the original. They cannot literally inhabit the same space, have the same reactions and interactions. Every single, and I really mean every single part of your individual experience of the world is unique to you, and that's amazing. It's arguably the closest I myself ever come to being religious or spiritual being aware of this. That and listening to music. 
which is also a wholly unique experience for absolutely everyone. So never let anyone, especially someone who simultaneously praises a hyper-individualistic political philosophy, tell you otherwise. You are, in fact, a special little snowflake. And it's almost Christmas. Sex and gender are social constructs. Cis people don't daydream about being another gender. But am I trans enough? Now, unfortunately, not everyone can be as exceedingly lucky as I have been. It's something that's arguably a product of the male privilege that I shed only a year ago, but it took me a long time to fully grapple with the fact that even though my life has become significantly more challenging at times, I have also been incredibly fortunate in my own experience, and not everyone is as lucky. I was comfortable and felt safe enough to come out to my family and to my local music community almost immediately. I was able to start living as a woman full time within months of coming to these realizations, partially because I was able to buy a whole new wardrobe, makeup, etc, etc, because I'd been fortunate enough for GTA 6 to have dropped a trailer that very much benefited me in terms of my channel views and extra disposable income. I was self-employed and so didn't have to fear being ostracized or othered at a job that I was working at, and so on and so on. I say all of this not to brag, but to say this. I recognize not everyone can do it the way that I've done it, and as a result, I feel a sense of obligation to do what little I can to help others. Just please bear in mind, I am just me, and I cannot help you on your own personal journey directly. All I can do is tell my own story and hope that it helps other people who are questioning to come to their own understanding of their own journey of self-discovery. I may be taking a risk being out this loudly and publicly, but it's a risk that I, as a relatively privileged white woman living in one of the most LGBTQ-friendly countries on Earth, for now at least, feel I need to take for those who just can't. It's scary, especially now in the wake of this new world we're going to be living in, but you are not alone. Now is the time to seek out queer community and have solidarity with each other. I'm not saying don't let other queer people drive you crazy. That's that's kind of what we do. We fight. But families fight. At the end of the day, we're still family. All of us as queer people. And we, as queer people, get to choose our families. Stay safe. Stay alive. Resistance is crucial. So... If you are now questioning your own gender identity in any way, I must tell you that I can't give you answers, but I can give you resources. One of the most important of those resources is a living, evolving document which has completely unironically saved my life on more than one occasion. It was also a large part of the basis for this project, and I will be using it as a template going forward, as approved by the author. I am of course talking about the Gender Dysphoria Bible. This is a comprehensive and absolutely crucial series of short essays and musings about transgender history and generally obtaining a more complete understanding of what it actually means to be trans from the perspective of a trans woman. Then of course there's Turn Me Into a Girl and Turn Me Into a Boy, as well as a non-binary variant. These are fantastic little websites that are a great first step if you're just curious and want to wade into the waters of diverse gender expression a little bit slowly. The following is taken directly from the Turn Me Into a Girl website, which features several very important resources, and again, all of them will be included in the description and or top pinned comment. On Gender Dysphoria Dysphoria is a general word that's broader than how the trans community typically uses it. It describes a dim, deeply felt sense that something is wrong, even if you don't necessarily understand why. Some people experience gender dysphoria, which generally includes discomfort about how other people see them in gendered ways, or having to relate to people in a way that doesn't feel right because of their gender. 
One of the many reasons why we stress that you don't need to be dysphoric to still want to live as another gender is because gender dysphoria is much more common than you might think. Gender dysphoria often imitates a more general dysphoria about how you relate to people socially. If you want to understand the true nature of your dysphoria, it's important to look deeply at your own fearsome heart and take an honest look at what you need to thrive. Will living as a different gender help you find surer footing in life? Will it at least give you some space to explore and experiment? Living as a different gender will not necessarily fix all of your dysphoria or your ordinary depression. It isn't a silver bullet. However, we find engaging with dysphoria rather than turning away often gives people more breathing room so that they can take further steps more confidently. This feeling shows up in many ways, so we strongly encourage you to talk with other folks who've been through gender dysphoria and read through their experiences. Finally, I'm going to include various support hotlines and other resources for queer people in the description and top comment. A lot of these, or at least the phone numbers, come from a post from one of my favorite new users, Queen Coke Francis, so go support her as well, and if you have any other links, please send them to me on Patreon or Discord or by leaving a comment on the new channel. As she said in her post, do what makes Republicans more angry than anything, support your communities, and survive. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you stay safe and hopeful in this new world. I conceived of this video and began working on it long before the re-election of a convicted felon and rapist to the highest office on the planet. Him being elected the first time in 2016 felt like a fluke, especially with his defeat by Joe Biden in 2020. But this time, this time America has made a statement and queer people across the world have listened. Discovering that you could be trans can be very difficult in a good country with good LGBTQ protections. Doing so now in certain states of the US is, well, it's probably terrifying and it's going to get worse. I felt an obligation to make this video, to hopefully help other queer people discover who they are, even if it's just one, but please, if you think you might be that one? and you don't feel safe coming out wherever it is that you live, don't give up hope. And don't take yourself out of the fight. We need you. As Queen Coke Francis said in her post recently, do what makes Republicans more angry than anything. Support your communities and survive. The next four years are going to be difficult, and we're going to need as many of us as possible to support each other. You are not alone. We will get through this. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Additional funding for this channel is brought to you by my wonderful patrons over at patreon.com forward slash misinformed. All of my patrons receive my videos a little bit early and completely uncensored. You also receive all of the legacy posts from my old channel, which include over 100 original music tracks, as well as any new tracks made for any videos on this channel. You'll also get access to a patron-only Discord server and hear your name read aloud at the end of every video that I produce. Thank you so much to everyone who supports me. You are absolutely incredible, and I am beyond grateful. A very special thank you to my $50 tier patrons, Chuck K 45 and Mason Collin. And also thank you to Elidio Rodriguez, one is up, Eris Oblivion, Alex Bowman, Arthur Jones, Benjamin Cabral, Bobcat Racer, Chicken Nougat, Delonta Blaine, Dicastinator, Donovan Swartz, Owen Harmon, Eric Shively, Grilf, JB, Jason Marino, Jesse Overlord, John Marston, Justo87, Kenny Malloy, Keyless Baton, Laura, Liga Suxta, Madeline Moon, Maxwell Wrestling, Mike, Patrick Fitzgerald, 
Penguin Minton, Perry Smarts, Raging Foxy, Wren, Shane Henry, The Boss Camacho, Tolerance, Up Late Again 634563, and Wainamus Prime.